Great, thanks for having me here today. So I'm going to share my experiences with closed and open peer review processes today. I have some stories that basically have made me come to the conclusion that I will almost never participate in a closed peer review again. So there's a bit of drama, which should be fun. <laughs> so the problems with closed peer review are that the reviews can be inadequate, inconsistent, biased, and subjective. And that the editors are kind of in control of this process, in the process of how high the standards are for the ethics and the quality of the science. And this is because it's happening behind closed doors. So no one is ever going to see these reviews except for the authors, the editor, and the reviewers. And so there's no way for anyone from the outside to, to make sure there's uh, impose a quality control on the process. So John Tennant has some um, wise words to share about this. So he says that peer review needs structure, coordination, and control, but why should this imply a closed system? In a closed system, who, who is peer reviewing the editors? What are the editorial decisions based on? Why and who are editors selecting as reviewers? These are all questions that are obscured by traditional peer review and traits of a closed, secretive, and subjective system not the rigorous, objective, gold standard that we hold peer review to be. So open peer review can address these issues. So what is open peer review? So actually, there are apparently 122 definitions of open peer review or open review. So I'm going to focus on the things that I'm talking about when I say open peer review. So what I'm mostly going to discuss in this talk is the review history being published alongside the publication, which you can see here for a couple of my articles. So here's an article in PeerJ. You're looking at the article, and then off to the side is a link that says Peer Review History. If you click on that link, it comes up in a new window. It's a PDF um, that has its own DOI, and you can see the original reviewer's comments. You can see my rebuttal to their comments. You can see the editorial decision. Then you can see the second round of reviewer remarks and my rebuttal to those and the editorial decision and then some back and forth between me and the editor to finish off the polishing of the, the manuscript. So you can see everything that happened before um, the paper was accepted. And the same at Royal Society Open Science. If you click one of these tabs, you can look at the article or you can look at the peer review history and it's the same thing there. So. There are other um, interpretations of open peer review. One is that you publish this review history and also sign your reviews. In the case of PeerJ and Royal Society Open Science, they don't require reviewers to sign their reviews, but they're encouraged to. And then sometimes peer re open peer review is just called, um, if you sign your review, then it's considered an open peer review. And I'll touch a bit on post-publication review uh, at the end. So the benefits of open peer review are really in, in the goal, which is to improve peer review through transparency. So this increases the accountability of the reviewers and editors because we can do meta research on it. The data are there so we can analyze it and see, are the editors, uh, is there a variance amongst individual editors? How can we improve? Do we have a problem and do we need to improve it and what can we do to improve it? Also, readers can learn more about the research. So I don't know, if, if you publish a paper, a lot of back and forth happens between the reviewers and the authors about, well, why did you do this? And then you explain it, but maybe that doesn't end up in the paper. And so author, other readers can learn more about your actual, the actual research paper that you published. And reviewer comments can be much more civil and useful if they know it's going to be publicly available especially if they sign. So not only will it be public, but their name is attached to it. So they want to make sure they're, they're grounding their comments in, in evidence rather than just saying, well, this is crap. I'm going to reject it. And this is sometimes what happens. And then it can also be used as a teaching tool. So students can learn about the peer review process before they actually publish a paper. So I'll share with you some reactions from publishers, authors, reviewers, and editors. Here is some data from PeerJ. Um, over about a year and a half long period from about 610 articles, authors were given the option to publish the peer review history or not. And 80% of authors chose to publish the peer review history alongside the paper, like I showed you earlier with my paper. So it's a popular option. People are choosing this. 
In terms of the reviewer reactions, those about 40% of those reviewers of these articles chose to sign their reviews, as well as um, having so the, the reviewers did not have an option about whether the review was open or closed, but they knew that it was going to be an option when they were invited to review the paper, that it, was, it could be made public. Now, those individuals who were reviewing, who chose to sign their reviews, they were more likely to sign if they were recommending a positive decision, acceptance or minor revisions. Now, this becomes a bit of an issue if you only sign the reviews that you are favorable, for, uh, in favor of in terms of the paper, um, because then if you're saying, it can, it can make your comments less honest if you're rejecting a paper. Um, it can make your review less thorough, but also it might indicate that you have a conflict of interest with the authors, and this is something that's really important to consider. The standard practice is that you should not review a paper for authors who are who you have collaborated with or been a co-author with for the past three over the past three years, or if you're at the same institution. So the same institution is a good one because if you are um, judged on, let's say, in the ref, let's say the number of papers your institution has, if that can improve your institution's rankings in some scale, then you might be more likely to accept this paper. So the conventional wisdom is, if you choose to sign your reviews, sign all your reviews. If you choose not to sign your reviews, don't sign any of your reviews. So from a different data set, the, in 2015 and 2016, five Elsevier journals decided to pilot publishing the, open, or the review history alongside the articles, and then questioned the reviewers and editors after this, this happened. So they found that 95% uh, of the review re reviewers said that publishing the review reports did not influence their recommendation. 76% said the fact that their reports would be publicly available did not change their wording. So they're staying, um, they're not, they're staying honest with what they actually think about the paper and not trying to change it, uh, their actual opinion of it. About 45% gave consent to reveal their names. So they signed their reviews, similar to the member at Pure J. And uh, those 36% who preferred to stay anonymous said that they would reveal their names next time. So it seems like they're having a positive experience with this. And of the reviewers who declined, most of them said that the, the publication of the peer review history was not an, a factor in that decision. Mostly they were not available. Now for the editors of these papers, 33% noticed an improvement in the review quality, with 70% of these editors noting that the reviews were more in-depth and constructive for authors to improve the quality of their manuscript. So now I'm going to tell you one of my dramatic stories about a closed peer review that I did recently. I was a reviewer for an article, and I raised a lot of issues, and some were insurmountable. So I submitted my review, uh, the, the decision that I was CC'd on was that it was a major revision to the authors. And now I didn't hear anything. I, I heard nothing, and all of a sudden I get an email asking me to write a commentary on this accepted article. And I was like, wait, where did this come from? So I looked at the article, and almost nothing had changed, and certainly my comments had not been addressed at all. And there were actual errors in the paper. So I emailed the executive editor, the handling editor, and the president of the society. This was a scientific society journal and that I was a member of. And I said, look, this, uh, the decision was major revision, but they didn't revise and now it's being accepted. The work is really low quality and there are some significant errors in it. So you're just going to accept it? Like this shouldn't happen. Um, and and they, didn't, they didn't care. All they said was, uh, we fully support our editors, we back their decisions. So they are not even thinking about editorial quality control. They're not, they're not considering this. And I'm trying to improve science, and I'm getting um, some nasty emails from these editors and the president. So now I'm, I'm in the acknowledgments of this paper, which looks like I endorsed it. And they can't see the review history, so they don't know that I did the opposite of endorse it. And I also wasn't asked to be in the acknowledgement, so I couldn't refuse. And, and so I, I got so frustrated with this that I, I 
I said, look, to myself, I, 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 I'm only going to participate in open peer reviews so that this doesn't happen to me again. That was a huge waste of my time. And um, it, was, it resulted in bad science. So from the other side of this open peer review, signing reviews, I sign all my reviews unless it's a double blind. So double blind is when I don't know who the authors are and the authors don't know who the reviewers are. But if it's single blind where the author, I know who the authors are, but the authors don't know who the reviewers are, I, I name myself. And I think that, so I, and I name myself in all of the ones, so I, even the ones I recommend rejections for. And I, I think it really does ensure that I'm respectful because I can phrase my comments in a useful way. The editor is the one who does the ultimate rejecting of the paper. So I can say, look, in order to answer this question, you need to set it up this way. And so I don't understand how this worked. And, and, and so I've found some creative ways to phrase things in a positive light while suggesting that it's not um, getting at what they were trying to get at. And I have only had positive experiences with this. So when I go to conferences, authors will come up to me and actually thank me profusely for my reviews because they said that they were really helpful and uh, that their paper benefited it from it. I've had their supervisors come up and thank me, saying that, oh, I should have done that. That would have been my job. Thank you for doing it for me. And I've had a collaboration come out of it uh, that we decided to collaborate on some future research. So if you want to do participate in the open peer review process, you can always sign your reviews, unless it's a double blind situation, but you can sign your reviews at any journal, even if they're, they're coming back to you, well, are you sure you want to sign your reviews, which I have had happen to me. Yes, I want to sign my reviews, and so um, they'll put it through. But also, if you want to do the open review history that's published alongside the article, there are several journals right now that offer that option. So Science Open, Royal Society Open Science, eLife, F1000 Research, and Peer J are just some of these journals. And then there's Publons, who if you were here for the morning session, uh, where you can have a profile and all of your reviews that you participate in, participated in um, go at this website and then they do the work for you to see, well, can reviewers at this journal publish their reviews or not? Um, they go through and decide all that. So you just upload all your content to your profile and then you choose your settings. Yes, I want to publish my review content. I want to publish the title of the article um, in terms of that this information is visible to the public. And so if you set your settings to as open as possible, then if the journal allows it, then you'll be able to see all of your reviews uh, at this website. Now, the copyright of the reviews are the re reviewers own the copyrights to the reviews because, uh, because authors own the copyrights to what they write. Now, this is unless the journal has an implicit policy that says that it's not the case, that they actually own the reviews, which um, came out recently. John Tennant with Elsevier, who um, asked the authors if he could put the review on his blog. He did, and then Elsevier came after him because they said they own the content. So that was a bit of a, a battle. But the nice part about Publons is that it takes care of it for you, it, unless you're actually uh, reviewing for a journal that offers the open review history where you know it's all going to be open. So we can also take control of where we're donating our reviewer time. And it's only recently that I started thinking about my reviewer time as a commodity. It's a service I'm providing to journals and publishers. And I have adopted some publishing ethics that are pretty strict and realized I don't want to donate my time to journal, uh, publishers like Elsevier and Wiley because I won't submit papers there. So why should I give them a service for free that they can go and make a lot of money off of the paper that results? And so now when I am invited to review for a journal that uh, is either not open access or is at a publisher that I am not in support of, I accept the review and in the comments to the authors I write this standard piece of, of text which says, outlines my publishing ethics and says that I will only review papers that meet these criteria. One of the criteria is that the paper has to publish a review history alongside that paper when it's an option. And since this um, journal and this paper and this publisher does not meet these criteria, I'm not going to review the paper. So this lets authors, so if the editor actually sends this out to, uh, as a review, that which some, some journals do, um, then this indicates to the authors that my, my reviewing ethics have changed. And so if they want me to review for their papers, because often they do ask for me specifically 
they would need to submit to the particular journals for me to be a reviewer. This also gets the people inside the process talking, editors, journals, hopefully, uh, about, oh, okay, our, our um, services that people are providing for us, their people are changing, and publishing is changing, and maybe we need to um, change with the times. As I recently discovered, it also results in slightly a bit of editorial control. I, had it, I did this, uh, just as I told you, within two hours of getting the review invitation. And I get an email from the editor saying, I really wish you would have told me about this in email, you know, privately. You're just sabotaging the system, stuff like this. Um, I certainly didn't take too much time out of the review process to, to do this because I submitted my review instantly. But the uh, content of his email indicated to me that maybe he wasn't even reading some of the reviews before making decisions on papers. I'm not sure. Um, but another indication that we really need editorial quality quality control. Now I said I'd touch on post-publication review. So there are a variety of different ways that this can happen. Here are a couple. One is that um, at PureJ, it's more of a commentary. So a paper is published, and if you like hold your mouse over one of the paragraphs, this bar on the left side appears, and you can click on the bar and ask a question of the authors, and the authors can respond, and so you can kind of continue the thread of the science um, after the pet paper has come out. So it's this kind of ongoing commentary after the paper has been published. Also, there's a, a kind of a living document. So F1000 Research, here um, version one was the paper that the authors submitted to the journal, and then uh, in response to comments that anyone can make, uh, the authors can decide to revise the paper. If they revise the paper, they release another version of it. Version two, version three. And so this is nice because the actual paper itself can continue to be revised throughout its whole life. And so it's a, a living document rather than something that was being archived. So what does open peer review achieve? Well, it increases scientific rigor through transparency and accountability because it allows quality checking of editors, reviewers, and authors. And it can turn an archived paper into a living document. And so I kind of think about open peer review as this process where first you've got the closed peer review system here. This peer review is happening inside the fishbowl. The fish inside the fishbowl know what's, what's happening, but no one on the outside can see it. And then open peer review is where you've got the fishbowl and there's a transparent, it's glass. So you can see through it and you can see the what happened during the peer review process. And then post-publication peer review is where now the fishbowl is starting to kind of dissolve and the edges are, are not clear because you're getting peer review before and after the paper has been published and the, the conversation can continue. So I think I have some time for questions and I'm happy to discuss whatever you would like to discuss now. Thank you for listening. Um, I have a question about the PJ slide that you showed that said the number of people that agreed to publish the, the review history. Was that before or after the peer review process had taken place? So did they agree up front to publish it, or did they agree after the articles were accepted, and then they're like, yeah, sure, that's fine. So at PJ, um, the reviewers, when they're invited to review, they don't know whether it's going to be made open or not. They're made aware that it could be made open. And the authors don't actually have to decide right away. They, I think the authors have to decide before they get their reviews in, um, but not when they submit the paper. They kind of get, get an email afterwards saying, would you like to make this review open or not? So at the point of submission and when everything happens, um, no one's quite sure, but everyone knows it's an option. Uh, hi, uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, David Kernahan from uh, your disk. Uh, just thinking about your talk alongside Lawrence uh, Gatto's talk this morning. Uh, just wondering if you had had any experience of uh, reviewing papers with large 
uh, data sets um, in an open peer review setting and uh, how that went. So just to make sure I'm understanding, uh, how do I have personal experience reviewing papers with large data sets? Um, yes, in a closed peer review system, I, I have reviewed papers where um, there's a lot of supplementary material attached. Uh, usually the papers I review, they don't have their data in repositories at that point. Um, but I always review all the supplemental material and um, comment it on it as well as the actual paper. Because um, I think it's my job to review everything that's involved with the whole submission process. And in papers, it, so if I'm reviewing for a journal that has specific ethics on publishing data, I make sure that the authors properly are, are, are doing that. And I have made several comments um, on a variety of reviews where I've said, well, this is this, the data that's being um, made open is not adequate enough to actually be open, and then I would need to see it now. So yeah, I definitely make sure that I review that part of the process as well. Thank you very much, Corina. You're a star. Um, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. And in this entirely overly competitive um, environment, academia, um, ethics are not necessarily the very top of your list, very top priority, because it's, it's very competitive sometimes, over and over and over again. Ethical can be seen by some as a, an issue that will hinder your progress um, in your academic career. So do you have, what, what's your opinion and, and your experience with that? Mm. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of, especially us early career researchers, have a lot of pressure to publish in particular journals because they're subjectively considered a higher quality when actually if you look at the rigor of the journals they're mostly closed so they actually you can't check to see if their the work is rigorous or not um, so I think that researchers are, are the ones who primarily create this pressure in the first place and we're all researchers so until we change our mind and change our choices it's not going to change so how about the buck start stops here and we change what we value the thing about publishing ethically is that it is actually in alignment with scientific rigor. And so I'm not seeing a conflict here. The only conflict I'm seeing is this you know, cultural artifact that's passed down, which, which we think is what we're supposed to publish in these particular places. So perhaps I, I am taking a risk by um, only publishing in particular ways and by being loud about it. But actually, I've just been rewarded for it. I got a really good job, um, in part because of my publishing ethics. So uh, hopefully that bodes well for more of us. Um, but certainly, it's uh, a culture that we need to change. And I think we can. Thank you.